I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to Luke chapter 22. Luke 22 is our text. And if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device and you're in the room, then grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Uh, Turn to page 1049, 1049, you'll be able to find Luke 22, be able to follow along with us. And as always, if you're in the room and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we believe if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. And if you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then let us know. Message us, message the service host. host. We will get you a Bible. Whether we need to mail that to you or deliver it to your house, uh, we want you to have God's Word and to read and apply it so that you can experience the life-changing power of Jesus. Hey, I have heard it said by people, especially people who are like facing a, a tough challenge, failure isn't an option. But I I say failure isn't an option. It's an absolute reality. I I mean, come on. We fail in life. Well, I don't know about you guys. I fail in life. Anybody with me? Okay, see, I saw these hands. I I think that's like the most enthusiastic response I've ever had when I've asked for a response. Anybody else fail? Yep, we're... uh, Maybe you're lifting the hand of the person sitting next to you. I don't know, but... uh, But, you know, we fail. Uh, I mean, have you ever broken a promise or failed at a commitment or just didn't live up to your own expectations? Right? I mean, at work, you know, say, hey, I'll finish the project. I'll get it done. You can count on me. And you forgot. Or maybe your friends, you know, you say, hey, I'm here if you need anything. But when they call, you're not there. Or maybe they're getting ready to move and you say, hey, you know, we'll stay close. We'll, we'll stay in touch. We'll, you know, we won't let the distance get us because friends are friends forever if the Lord's the Lord of them. Right? Ah, uh, see, I know who the children of the 70s and 80s are now. We say to our kids, I'll, I promise you, I'll make it to the game. I'll be there for the recital, the program. Hey, we'll play ball tomorrow. We'll do it later. And later never comes. We say to our spouse, I will love you forever in sickness and in health, better for worse, richer for poor, forsaking all others till death do us, oh well. (laughs) Right, I mean, or we just say to God, I promise I will never do that again. You see, if you've ever failed or if you've ever felt like a failure or a loser or a reject, then this message is for you. It's for us because we're talking about the Apostle Peter and the great failure. The great failure. Let me me just, uh, let's look at Luke 22. I'm going to bounce around a little bit. First of all, I'm going to pick up at verse 33. Uh, Jesus and the disciples are at the, the Last Supper where Jesus institutes communion. They're getting ready to go pray in the garden. And and Jesus tells Peter, I'm praying for you so that Satan's not gonna shred you, you know, like cheese on a grater, in my words. Uh, And then Peter says this, verse 33, Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Jump over to verse 54. They've arrested Jesus. They've taken him to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. It said, then they seized Jesus and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light, and looking closely at him, said, hey, this man was also with Jesus. But Peter denied it, saying, woman, I don't know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them, right? But Peter said, man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, certainly this man also was with Jesus, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. 
And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Now, this is probably the best known portion of Peter's story. We know he's an apostle. We know that he's been following Jesus for three years. He's heard Jesus teach. He's watched him perform miracles. He's pronounced him as the Messiah, the son of the living God. Peter is in Jesus' inner circle. So, you know, there's the 12, but then there's the three. There's Peter, James, and John, and they're the ones who get to see all the coolest miracles and experience all the, the private times with Jesus. And, of course, Jesus says, hey, you're going to abandon me and, and everything. You're gonna, and Peter says, no. No, I'm never going to abandon you. I'm never going to deny you. And even if I have to die, and then a few hours later, Peter denies knowing Jesus three times publicly. I don't know it, what you consider a failure, but this is a total fail. I mean, he failed every way that you can fail. There's no excuses. He denied even knowing who Jesus was because he was afraid and he thought he might better save his own life than acknowledge that he was a Galilean or acknowledge that he'd been with Jesus. He didn't know that it would mean anything. He, just, he didn't even take the chance. And when I read Peter's story, it kind of reminds me of our story. My story, your story. Doesn't it? I mean, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that Jesus you know, died on the cross to pay for your sins, and you believe he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus, see, there's that following part then we know that Jesus loves us and we know that Jesus has saved us and we know that Jesus promises us heaven, right? He's gonna take us there. He's prepared a place for us. And yet we still fail. I still fail. I mean, we rebel against God. We sin. We disobey. We deny. I mean, time after time, we choose the wrong path. I mean, sometimes we do it accidentally, but usually it's on purpose. Usually we're looking in the mirror, looking at the, the way to go, and we go, well, I know I should go this way, but right now I feel like doing this. And we make conscious choices knowing that what we're doing is not what God wants us to do as his followers, as his children. That's our story. Now, I don't know about you, but I read Peter's story. <laughs> and there's a part of me that when I read it, I judge him. Anybody else judge him? You know, I read it and I go, I'd do better. Right? I, I like to think that I'd do better. All right, I try to lie to myself and tell myself I would do better. Right? Because then I get honest and I look at my own life and, and uh, like Peter, it's filled with broken promises. Right? I mean, Peter declared... I am ready to go to prison and die with you. That's the Gospel of Luke. In the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, uh, he said, even if I must die, I will not deny you. Now, I don't know about you. It's easy to judge him, but, you know, hey, uh, it wasn't like he forgot because it was like months later. We're talking about hours. We're talking about in the moment. We're talking about he just ran away when they arrested Jesus. Yeah, he tried to start a fight, but uh, Jesus said, don't do it, and then they all split. And, and so, you know, if you're not sure that you're like Peter, if you're not sure that you're like me and, and you fail all the time, just look at the broken promises that you've made to God. Here, let's, let's see how comfortable we are confessing a little bit. How many of you have ever made a promise to God? Yeah, it goes something like this. God, if you'll rescue me out of this mess, if you'll fix this problem, I will. <laughs> and then you fill in the blank, right? I will go to church every week. I will read my Bible every day. I will volunteer to work with children in the early childhood. And yet we break those promises. Or how often do we say, okay, God, I am so sorry for that sin. I will never commit that sin again. I will never do it again. And then there's the oops. I mean, maybe it was a year later. Maybe it was a month later. Maybe it was a day later. Maybe it was an hour later. It doesn't really matter. You did it again. 
And, and in fact, you, you repent for the same sin so many times that you start to become convinced that God is angry with you. He's tired of your failure, and he's just done with us. So anyone ever been there? Yeah, I have. And you must think, hey, God is so completely over me because I'm a failure. And like Peter, we weep bitterly. We're filled with guilt and with shame and remorse. Well, if you've ever been there or felt that way, here's the good news. God is not afraid of your failures. God is not afraid of your failures. God knows you and he loves you. God sees your life and he is completely aware of your sin. All your sin. And he still wants you in his family. He, he still wants you in his family. See, I don't know about you, but that's why here at Calvary we get excited talking about uncomfortable grace. Because when you realize the love of God for you and the mercy that he offers you, the forgiveness that flows to you, it ought to get you really excited. Because Psalm 139 says that God even knows every single thought in your brain. <laughs> now, right now, I mean, if you're just like me, you're like going, oh, that's bad. That is so bad. I mean, God knows every evil, angry, disgusting, judgmental, selfish, and perverted thought you have ever had. See, I just think about that and I go, wow, I really do deserve to burn in hell. Okay? The wages of sin is death. I have earned a trip to eternal damnation. Yet, the gift of God is eternal life. God knows all of that about us and he still wants you to follow him. He still wants to call you his child. Just think about that. It, that that's wonderful, that's amazing. But don't just take my word for it. See it in the story. God is not afraid of your failure because we see this not just in the great failure but the great redemption. The great redemption. See, here's the thing. Peter's story doesn't end with his failure. This is not Peter denies, Jesus looks at him, he runs out and weeps, story over. This is a chapter in Peter's story. It's a great failure, but it doesn't end there. He did not let his failure define his life. Let me say that again. Peter did not let his failure define his life. See, after this great failure... Peter experiences a great restoration. First of all, we see the amazing forgiveness that Jesus offers him. Okay, so if you don't know the background, so, uh, you know, two days after this, <laughs> you know, this is Friday, and then on Sunday morning, it's the, the first Easter, right? You guys know that, right? Jesus rises from the dead. The, the ladies go and discover the empty tomb. The angels tell him he's not here, he's risen. They run into Jesus. They go back and tell the apostles. The apostles are skeptical about what the women say they've seen. And then, of course, Jesus reveals himself to them. He explains what's happened. He commissions them. But here's the thing. Notice what Jesus doesn't do in the account of Easter morning. He doesn't throw Peter out of the group. Right? He doesn't go, hey, guys, it's great to see you, except for you, Peter. <laughs> Hit the road, Jack, because you failed. Right? He doesn't, he doesn't do that. He, he doesn't really do anything to the other 10 failures as well, you know, who, who ran away and didn't even follow close enough to have to deny. And, and I don't know about you, but I, this is something that, uh, if you're a parent, this may challenge you a little bit. And if you're an older parent, you may have to call and apologize a little bit. Do you notice that Jesus didn't even do the parent lecture to the disciples? Well, I told you you were going to deny me. <laughs> but you didn't listen to me. Right? He didn't even pull that. He just said, look, here's my hands, here's my side. Give me something to eat. I mean, it just was like that. And then later in, in John 21, it tells a story because Jesus, you know, was after the resurrection, before he ascended, was here 40 days. 
and he, Jesus and Peter have like a private conversation. And it's a conversation of restoration and again, forgiveness in a very loving and painful way because Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes. Jesus says, feed my sheep. But here's the thing. Jesus asked Peter that question three times. Three times he says, Peter, do you love me? <laughs> and three times Peter had to say, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Do you think there was any significance to Jesus asking that question three times? Do you think he was like kind of going back to the whole denial thing and I always want you to know this is all good, but we're, we're covering this? You see, Jesus forgave Peter for his failure, his denial, his broken promises. And Jesus forgives us. Jesus forgives you. See, I, I know what happens in, in, in church world. I've, I've been around it long enough is that we all sing the praises of God because he forgives us, but we sit there as individuals thinking he forgives everyone but me. He forgives everyone else. He's got grace enough for everyone else, but not me because I'm too rotten. I'm too disgusting. I'm too much of a failure, too much of a sinner. I, I know better. And, and so we just kind of, you know, keep torturing ourselves. But I want you to hear this. Jesus forgives you. The Apostle John in his first letter, first chapter, he says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we will have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us of all sin. A few verses later, he says, if we confess our sin, God is faithful and righteous and will forgive us our sin and purify us of all unrighteousness. Did you guys hear how many times he said all? If we confess, we are forgiven of all our sin, period. We are purified of all our unrighteousness, all of it. You are forgiven by God. So are you aware today, right now, where you're sitting, that, that Jesus forgives you? Okay, it's not a rhetorical question. Are you aware today? Where you're sitting, you guys need to answer out loud at home too. Where you're sitting, where you're watching, are you aware that Jesus has forgiven you of all your sins? Yes. Okay. If God has forgiven you, will you forgive yourself? Yeah. See, a lot less enthusiasm there. <laughs> a lot less enthusiasm. See, uh, some are living a joy-deprived life even though God forgives you because you're still punishing yourself. Let me say that again. You're choosing to live a joy-deprived life because even though you understand mentally the grace of God applies to you and all of your sins are forgiven through the sacrifice of Jesus, his death and resurrection, you have believed in him, you've confessed him as Savior and Lord, you've asked him to forgive you, he has forgiven you completely and totally, but you're not accepting all of his forgiveness. And so you're living joy deprived because you think you have to punish yourself more than God himself will punish you. It's unnecessary. It's unproductive. It's unhealthy. And, and some of you are like going to beat yourself up for it because I said that. You know, we have counseling help for you. We have a great ministry called Celebrate Recovery. Uh, I encourage you guys to check that stuff out because, uh, yeah, you failed. And you're forgiven. Accept it. Look, I'm just going to tell you, it is not the will of God for anyone to wallow in regret and guilt and shame. Ever. It's not what he wants. He wants you to understand you are forgiven, just like Peter was forgiven. And, and now you, you are restored to that relationship. And just imagine, if, you, if, you're, if you're struggling with this, just imagine that, that Jesus is looking at you saying, do you love me? Do you love me? And then say yes. You know I love you, Lord. Okay then. Okay then. Let's get to work. Let's take care of people. You're in relationship with me. So Peter was forgiven and we know he received mercy and, and, and we've received mercy too. And we know that Peter was forgiven because the next time we see Peter, he is involved in powerful service. Powerful service. 
Okay, so if, uh, if you're following along, you want to read this later, uh, write down Acts chapter 2 and go and read Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is the story of Pentecost. Pentecost was a celebration of uh, uh, the Jewish people. And, and on that celebration of Pentecost, uh, Jesus had already left and he told them to wait for, you know, a season. And, and then uh, the Holy Spirit was given to every believer that day. And so they went out, they were excited, they started preaching and teaching and talking to people and a crowd gathered and Peter preached, Peter preached publicly, Peter preached publicly in the same area around the same people that crucified Jesus and 3,000 people trusted Christ. All right, let's go back to this. Peter who had freaked out because a servant girl had said, aren't you one of those, his followers? Now is standing publicly in, surrounded by thousands of people preaching Jesus 43 days later. 43 days later, isn't that amazing? I mean, we read it in the Bible, like, oh, that's pretty cool. No, this is amazing, this is incredible, this is wild. So remember, we're like Peter. His story is like our story, right? We've already established that. We kind of relate to him. We failed like Peter, and, and, and so we're like him that way. All of us have failed. We are forgiven like Peter. So if you've confessed Jesus as Lord, then you know, God has demonstrated you know, his forgiveness and mercy in your life. And God demonstrated his power in Peter's life, so you know what that means? That means that God wants to demonstrate his power in your life too. See, we, we can relate to Peter when it comes to the failure and maybe we can relate to Peter when it comes to the forgiveness, but, but can you relate to Peter when it comes to the power? Because God wants to demonstrate his power in your life in amazing ways. Uh, see, God wants to use your life to influence people to follow Jesus. That's how he demonstrated the power of God in Peter's life. The failure has 3,000 people respond day one of the church. Day one. Now, this is difficult for some of you to see. You see God's power in Peter's life. You see God's power in other people's lives. You just can't really imagine God's power in your life. I mean, you can celebrate his forgiveness. You know you're going to heaven, but you just think, oh, I've messed up too much. I'm disqualified. I can't serve Jesus. Um, and maybe a church or a pastor has even helped you to believe that. And if that's the case, I am sorry because they're wrong. They are wrong. Can I just tell you, God's grace is greater than any of your sin. Can I just tell you that Jesus' capacity to forgive you exceeds your capacity to screw up? That is not a challenge for some of you to try. Okay, that's just a statement of fact that you are, are forgiven, you're, you're accepted, and, and Jesus wants to use you. So if God called you, called you to follow him and you said yes, then God has called you to serve him. And he's given you the power to serve him. Um, you may or may not know that radical service is one of the core values here at Calvary. We believe that the followers of Jesus best demonstrate the love of Jesus to others through acts of kindness and service. And, and we've actually been doing that as a church. Two weeks ago, we had a community car show. Thousands showed up, and, and people were rubbing shoulders and, and uh, talking with people who never will come to church uh, and inviting them to church. We had a bunch of people come to church out of that. Then last week, we did serve our schools, and a bunch of you went out, like 200 of you went out and painted and cleaned and, and beautified our schools in town, and that was really cool. And, uh, and now, see, that you know what you're doing in all those? You were, you were planting seeds. Now it's time to harvest. So uh, here, I'm gonna, I just gotta challenge you to do something. Uh, Pastor Joe already mentioned the Easter invite cards, right? They're all out there. If you were here last week, annoying people were handing them to you as you left. You were like, I don't want this. I'm gonna come anyway. They were not for you. Okay, I know what some of you did. You took it home, you put it on your refrigerator so you'd remember what time Easter services are at Calvary. That is acceptable, but that is not the point. Okay, here's the challenge. I'm gonna, there's a whole bunch of these cards on all the connection centers. People will be handing them out again probably. Uh, when you leave tonight, 
take three of these cards, at least three of these cards, and invite three different people that don't go to church someplace else. This is really important, okay? Because we're trying to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, not just get people who already know Jesus to change churches. So uh, invite three people that don't go to church any place and see if God doesn't demonstrate his power through your obedience. Three people. If you don't know three people who don't go to church, you need to get out more. Uh, now, I, I don't want you to just leave these on the table at a restaurant, okay? I, I'm, I'm not, that's not a bad idea, you can do that, but it, honestly, if you're gonna leave it on the table, invite the waiter or waitress to come with you, okay? And, and give it to them with a $100 bill. That's a lot of incentive. So, uh, but I, I'm, just, I'm just saying, do, do something with this. If you, you go, I don't know people, great. Everybody in this town has somebody moving in on their street, right? Moving trucks are all the time. You just walk up to their house, go, you're near the town? Uh, my pastor said I had to invite you to church here. Now, I <laughs> try to do it better than that. But you, you get the point. Uh, three people, okay? Three people. If just one out of three says yes, can you imagine what God can do Easter Sunday or Easter Saturday because we have services then too? I'm just, it's just a, a way, and, and see, here's the thing. If you don't believe that God can use you to do powerful service, you won't ever ask anybody, and you won't ever do anything. But this is part of the, the experience of the power of God and the great restoration of God. See, no matter where you've been, what you've done, or what's been done to you, God wants to demonstrate his mercy and power in your life. Will you let him do that? So finally, Peter experienced a great redemption of serving and power simply because Peter didn't give up. Peter did not give up. He persevered. He endured. Peter failed, but he didn't quit. He cried, but he still believed. He broke his promise, but he saw God's redemption because Peter kept showing up. Do you know who in this story missed out on a chance of redemption? Judas Iscariot, the betrayer. You know, he betrayed Jesus into the hands of the priests. Then he regretted it, and, and he tried to give the money back and say what he'd done wrong, and, and they laughed at him, and he went out, and in his great sorrow, depression, despair, he hung himself. Do you know what I imagine? I imagine that if Judas hadn't taken his life, that he, too, would have had one of those amazing private conversations with Jesus that would have still been one of grace and restoration. That's just what I imagine because that's what Jesus does with everybody if they don't give up. I mean, Peter was broken in his failure. He was fearful of the consequences, but he experienced redemption because he endured. The Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter six, verse nine says, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap a harvest if, guess what? We do not give up. Let me read that again. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You want to see God's power in your life? You want to see God work miracles in your life? You want to see God restore and redeem and heal? Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't give up. I mean, look, some, some of you are here today, you're broken, you're weary, you've failed, others have failed you. You know, you've been betrayed, uh, promises have been broken, you feel hopeless, ashamed, guilty, hurt. Please don't give up. Don't give up on God. He still loves you and wants to redeem your life. Don't give up on church. We're flawed, but God wants to redeem through us. Don't give up on being forgiven and seeing God's power in your life. And please, please, please don't give up on life. Satan is wreaking havoc on the souls of people, convincing them that they'd be better off dead. And if you have those thoughts, if you, he's working in your life and he's getting you to that point where you're thinking, yeah, the world would be a better place if I wasn't in it, please get help. I mean, 
right now in this room, if you're in this room and you're having those thoughts, our prayer team is going to be here at the front at the end of the service. Please talk with them, pray with them. They would love to work with you and help you. We want to help you. If you're joining us online and, and you're thinking that I, there's no reason to go on, please don't give up. We're going to put the suicide hotline on there for you to be able to call someone and talk to them right now. But see, if we don't give up, God will redeem. If we don't quit, we will see the power of God in our lives. That's his promise. That's the way that Peter's life worked. That's the way our lives will work. Because Peter's story is our story. And from it, this is really cool, but from Peter's story, we know that God uses failures, losers, and rejects to build his kingdom and demonstrate his mercy. And I don't mind if Calvary is the spiritual island of misfit toys. Because I'm a failure, a loser, and a reject that gets to serve the living God. Hey, it was true for Peter. It's definitely true for me. It'll be true for you also. If you do not give up. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We're not always sure why you love us, but we're really glad that you choose to. We're glad that you have patience with us, that you call us to follow you, that you forgive all of our sins, that you promise us heaven when we deserve hell. And Father, you know our hearts, you know our weaknesses, you know our failures, and yet you still want to call us your children. So meet us in this place. Lord, for those who are broken, we pray for healing. For those that are in sin, we pray for repentance. For those that are discouraged, we pray that you, you would just give them strength and courage. Father, for those that right now just sense your spirit calling them to, to service and, and impressing people's names on their minds, God, we ask for doors to be open for us to be used by you to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And Father, my prayer right now is if there's anyone in this room, anyone joining us online that does not know you as Savior and Lord, that right now would be the time they choose to believe in the one and only Son of God. Lord, we love you. We want to give ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen.